last year I did a tandem skydive because I was just thinking, well, if I'm going to go out, do it in style. <laughs> if I'm honest, when I was first diagnosed with secondary breast cancer, I didn't expect to see the end of the year. They tell you that they can treat you, but they can't cure you. Um, and it honestly, it felt like a death sentence. It's just awful. You think your life's been taken away from you, and it happens in an instant. I do remember sitting in my car, pulling up, hands on the steering wheel, and screaming. Like, ah! I just had to, I was, I was so consumed of anger and frustration and everything else, so I just, I remember screaming, absolutely screaming in the car. Um, because I didn't, I didn't want to hurt the people. I didn't want to say how I felt, you know, and I, I just thought, I'm just going to park the car up and I'm just going to scream. And, I did, and it, it felt lovely. If I haven't had to do it since. <laughs> if I had been aware, told of the symptoms of secondary breast cancer, I could have raised that possibility with every doctor that I saw during those two years when I was having symptoms. If they had picked it up earlier, I'd probably be standing in front of you now with a different story. Those healthcare professionals didn't know how breast cancer would present on a darker skin body, so they maybe were not able to pick up on the discoloration of the breast and stuff like that. But for me, I mean, all the information that I know now, I was definitely presenting um, as someone who had breast cancer. Because I was 35 when I was diagnosed with my primary. Um, and it's really lonely because you are so young, you can't really relate to other people. Whenever I would always go into have treatment, they would always assume I was going in with my mum, who's like 30 years older than me, and it's like, no, I'm the patient. So it's probably about a D cup beforehand, which nicely masks you know, sort of like a tummy behind it or beneath it. And now suddenly this this tummy's appeared, so hence why wearing a poncho. I think, I think ponchos and scars are going to be my new best friends for a while. So, um, but went to a festival this weekend, tried to embrace the fact that I'm flat and, um, and as I say, just, uh, it, it's just gonna take a bit of time and a bit of getting used to. We did want children and I had um, IVF as well, um, and we created three little embryos um, called Wink and Blink and a Nod. <laughs> that that was, you know, in the bin, basically. Like, nope, you're not gonna have kids. You can't have kids. How can you have kids when you're living with an incurable illness that is really unlikely to allow you to live for five years? You try not to hurt your children, but you know, ultimately, with secondary cancer, I'm going to hurt her in the worst way. I'm going to leave her. I've written cards for important dates or important things in her life. So her 16th, 18th and 21st birthdays, for passing a driving test, for passing her exams, going to uni, first home, first baby, engagement, wedding day, um, in cards, and putting my words down for her because I can't give her me. I, I wouldn't say I'm a shy person, but I'm nervous of making, like, I'm nervous of close friendships because I don't want to, um, I don't want to damage people by, like, dying on them. <laughs> I'm gonna live my life as much and as full as I can and I'm going to embrace every opportunity that I have left in my life. Um, no, I don't want to say left. I am just going to embrace every opportunity in my life. It's given me this appreciation for who I am, my life, my friends, my family. I'm trying to give her a whole life in the six months that I've got left. Because I can't do anything more than that. If I had known the symptoms of secondary breast cancer, there would have been every chance that I would be diagnosed earlier, 
and therefore have years longer with my family. That seems very worthwhile to me.